Well, good morning, everybody. How are you? We are in Holy Week. Who's excited for Easter? We are really looking forward to it. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but there's no better way to start Holy Week as we look to Easter than with baptisms. And we are blessed to have two baptisms today we're going to start the service with. So please turn your attention to the baptistry, and we'll do those now. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Andrew Hall. Andrew is a longtime believer in Jesus, but before today has never been baptized into Christ. So he is obeying Jesus' command to do exactly that this morning. So, Andrew, I want to ask you to repeat what many of these folks have repeated uh, before, and that is Peter's confession of Christ that we find in Matthew chapter 16. I believe, I believe. that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ. The, Son of the, living God, the Son of the living God, and my Lord and Savior. And my Lord and Savior. Well, based on your confession, Andrew, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. for Andrew and Sophie. Lord, thank you for what you've done for us. Every time we see someone be obedient to in baptism, we're reminded of what you have done for us to make the forgiveness of sins possible. So Lord, it's our prayer that you will be with Andrew and Sophie as they begin this wonderful journey with you, that they will be used of you in mighty ways to be your representative to a lost and dying world. Thank you again for new birth into you. In Jesus' name. to see new life in the church and in the kingdom of God. We're so excited for that. And now on the stage, uh, we, we do a connect class, which you've heard us talk about. And we introduce people to membership. We introduce them to what our church is all about and what we believe in our history and what does it mean to belong to a church, commit yourself to become a member of the church. And so these wonderful people have decided that they would like Poplar Springs to be their church home. So would you welcome them this morning? It's always an honor and a privilege to talk about our church and to see that God is continuing to bring more and more people to check out what he is doing here. So we thank you all for trusting us with your family and your spiritual pursuit of the Lord. And we know that you're going to enjoy being a part of this wonderful congregation. So Andrew, who was baptized, this is his family here on the side. So he is uh, joining in with them today and all with the rest of them. And we have a few more in a couple weeks who are out of town uh, this morning that couldn't be here. So I'm going to ask them to also repeat Peter's confession. So uh, we love to do that as people join. So repeat after me. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Let me pray for you guys. Join me in prayer again, please. Father, what a privilege it is to be a part of your church. And your church is growing. You are drawing people to be a part of your kingdom. You are helping us thrive. And we thank you for all the men and women, the children, the families, the marriages, all the people you are bringing in to be a part of Poplar Springs. And we know and we see that you are doing great things here at our church. And so I pray for all of uh, these wonderful people as they join, that they would find their place to serve, that they would find 
their community and that they would feel a part of something big, something wonderful that you are doing. So we love you, we love them, and we love your church. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you stand and greet the people next to you and welcome them this morning. Well, church, if you would make your way back to your seats, we're going to worship together today.
Well, I can't think of a better way than to enter Holy Week with singing the song we're gonna be worshiping to next. This song is so simple, yet it's so profound, and you might have heard it before, but it parallels all we have been given and all we have received because of what Jesus gave on the cross. And I just wanna encourage us, you know, this is the beginning of Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday. We, re we remember Jesus riding in on a donkey, everyone waving palm branches, crying out, Hosanna. And as we continue, we'll, we'll remember the cross and then we will celebrate the resurrection. But I want us to, I wanna encourage you to approach this Holy Week with such a reverence, knowing that every step Jesus took, he took for you, every single one. And so as we continue in worship, I want us to fix our eyes on the cross behind me. And I just wanna give him gratitude and praise for all that we have is because of what he gave. And we are nothing without the cross, amen. Sing, I'm forgiven. And I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And I'm accepted, you were condemned. And I'm alive and well, your spirit lives within me Because you died and rose again Sing that again And I'm forgiven because you were forsaken And I'm accepted, you were condemned And I'm alive and well Amazing love. Amazing love. How can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love. I know it's true. It's my joy to
are so thankful for your grace. We're so thankful that your mercies are new every single day, Father, because you know that we need them. Father, we live in such a broken world and we are such broken people, but it's because you love us and sent your son Jesus to die on a cross in our place that we have an opportunity to have a relationship with you. We have an opportunity to get to know you, Father. We don't want just any old religion. We wanna to get to know you, Father, because that's what you want from us. So today, Father, our focus is on you and you alone. We wanna hear your voice. We wanna worship you. We wanna give you the honor, the glory, and the praise that you deserve, Father. We thank you so much for meeting us here in this place, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, church. So oftentimes when we read scripture, we naturally will read ourselves into the story as the hero. And what I mean by that, especially in the Old Testament, when we read the text, since we know the ending, it's easy to look at them and be like, what are you doing? Like, don't you know God's working this out? For example, I just started studying the book of Judges. If you haven't read Judges, it is probably one of the most frustrating books to read because they're foolish, we'll put it nicely. If you don't know Judges, there's a cycle the whole way through. Just jump in at any point and you'll see where they're at. Here's what the cycle is. That Israel rebels. They cry out to God asking where he is. God delivers them. He raises up a judge. They repent. Then they forget. Then they rebel. Then God judges them. Then they suffer. It's a complete cycle over and over and over again. You just want to reach through the text and just shake them. Be like, what are you doing? Don't you know you're the cause for your problems? Just stay focused. What are you? And then it hit me. I do the same thing. We do the same thing. How easy and quickly do we forget what God has done in our life? How quickly do we forget the blessings that God has blessed us with? That is why we do communion every week. So we never forget this. We never forget what God has done for us, but even more, we also remember what we have done. Let's start with that. What we have done, just like the Israel, we have sometimes goldfish brain memory. We so quickly forget what God has done. We so quickly turn back to our old ways and then we start going like, why are we suffering? It's like, well, you're going back to it. And this is what God did. He knew our condition. He knows our issues. He knows our struggles. He knew that in the Old Testament, no judge he raised up was going to be worthy. No judge was going to be able to deliver them. So what he did is he took it personal and he stepped in and became our judge for us. And that's why we do communion every week. To remember the sacrifice he did for us. Because he knew that there was no way for us to save ourselves. So he came down to this earth and took it personal. He stepped in and said, I'm going to be the judge. I'm going to be the executioner and everything. I'm going to judge for what sin has done. Then I'm also going to take the punishment for you. I'm going to extend grace, extend mercy. So during this time of communion, I want you to just sit in awe. I want you to sit and remember what we have done and what was necessary by God to save us. To step in, in our place, to offer salvation. So take your time in communion and we'll close together.
Father, we come to you in this time of every service so we don't forget what you have done. We come to you to remember how you took it personal. You stepped in in our place. You stepped in to be the good judge, the good shepherd, the good priest, our sacrifice. Lord, we know our condition. I pray we are continued reminded of our condition wherever that is and we know that we have nothing to offer for our salvation except our sin and our acceptance and repentance to you and I pray we can live in that and we would never forget that that you've done everything necessary to save us to offer our salvation freely Lord we thank you for Jesus we pray this in your son's name amen Thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> I want to share a few final details with us looking ahead to next week and all that we have planned to celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. So, Good Friday. Uh, we have not done that here as a church in a long time, if ever, a service on Good Friday. The service is at 6.30 p.m. <clears throat> we have... Uh, dinner will be provided for us at 5.30 p.m. We'll actually be open a little bit before that if you're able to get here before. We want to make sure everyone has time to eat, <clears throat> get through the line, and then join us over here right at 6.30 for the service. We want you to come so bad. We're putting the menu on the screen right now for dinner. We're having a team freshly prepare barbecue for us, okay? So that's going to be great, and all the other things beside that, and of course, multiple desserts as we do here in North Carolina in the South. So we will feed you well. You may fall asleep in the dark during the sermon, but you're going to be well fed. But we really want to serve you, create a time of fellowship, prepare our hearts to come over here and worship. Jesus for his sacrifice on Good Friday. So we'd love for you to, to register, let us know. It's free, but we want to know how many people to prepare for. So if you could do that before today is over, that would be a tremendous help for us. And then let's think about Easter Sunday. Two services. Thank you for those who texted us last week. It looks like the first service will be a little bit more full. So if you haven't decided which service to attend, we'd love for you to come to the second service at 11 to continue to fill out that service. It'll be a little bit lighter, but we're going to have a good bit of people at both services, and we would love for you to, to be here to join us. They'll be identical. We have the children taken care of for that, and it's going to be a wonderful time to worship Jesus for all that he did for us, the resurrection of Christ that changed the world. And then you think about the Easter offering. It's an extra offering that we are putting in front of all of our people in our congregation. It's a beautiful tradition of this church. So many people have worked so hard to build these buildings, to develop this land, to build a youth building, to pay off the debt on the buildings. And it's so amazing to see the generosity of the church over the years to continue to move us forward. And we're hungry to keep stewarding what God has blessed us with. We are hungry to continue to provide quality and excellence and flexibility with what we're doing because God continues to bring more and more people to our church. So our heart and our desire is to replace the carpet in here, to refresh it, to make it clean and nice and new. It's been over 20 years old and it's time for that uh, to be replaced. And we'd like to bring chairs to replace the pews so that we can have a room that's multi-purpose, that's flexible. You can control the chairs. You can do different things in here. We want the opportunity to be able to do as many different things as we possibly can in our church, in the main room that we worship in. So our goal is $80,000. It's a big goal, but we're asking you to pray. How does God want to utilize you to help us move forward? An extra financial gift so that we can keep stewarding what God has blessed us with. Because we feel like as a staff, as leadership, we're just getting started. Amen? Amen? God is doing wonderful things here. And we want to keep moving forward as best we can. Today, Don's going to preach on another encounter um, in the book of Luke. If you want to turn to Luke 19 and prepare for that, we're going to get to the message in just a moment.
good morning again. It is wonderful to be with you today. And folks, it is an awesome time to be a part of uh, this wonderful fellowship of believers. We're so glad that you're here and are very grateful for your contribution. Well, as Griffin said, we're continuing our message series today called Encounter. And over the last several weeks, we've been looking at the different characteristics and the virtues of Jesus, like his servanthood, his worthiness, his mercy and authority. And specifically, we've examined the encounters that people have had with Jesus and how they were impacted by those experiences. This morning, we're gonna be talking about the mission of Jesus. Well, when I use that term mission, what is it that comes to mind for you? Well, the Random House College Dictionary defines the word mission this way, a specific task that a person or group of persons is sent to perform. Now, sometimes a mission, as you know, is carried out in a rather official way. Several folks from our church through the years have been on short-term mission trips, both domestically and abroad, and they've done those to go and assist a particular missionary or an organization on site with certain tasks that will help to enhance that ministry or they have gone to rebuild areas that maybe were damaged by catastrophic weather events. But other missions are performed because we created and chosen them. Let me give you an example. Take you moms. At approximately 5 a.m. every weekday, you arise to the same mission, don't you? You get up, you fix breakfast, probably some lunches as well. You make sure that the kids are dressed and off to school and then you go and get ready and are probably out the door to work yourself sometime before 8 a.m. And ladies, we dads, we husbands, stand back in awe of you because we are capable of so little of that. <laughs> Please don't ever leave us. <laughs> well, when it comes to Jesus' mission, we'll identify that in just a couple of minutes, but what might be best for us to do before we define it is to be sure that we understand what Jesus' mission is not. This is not an exhaustive list, but a couple, and I think it will be helpful. First of all, Jesus' mission is not to make us happy. Now, does Jesus want us to be happy? Of course, but he is far more interested in our being obedient to him. Because you see, when we do what he says fairly consistently, then and then only will we find the true happiness and fulfillment that we're after. Some people believe in what I call the Jesus of my happiness. They think whatever they do, even if it's immoral, unethical, or illegal, Jesus smiles on, he approves of, he even enthusiastically endorses because he just wants them to be happy but y'all, Jesus' mission is not to make us happy. Also, Jesus' mission is not to remove all the bad things that can happen to us. We've all heard the term helicopter parents. Helicopter parents are those who hover over their kids to prevent them from getting hurt by the normal stuff that just happens to pop up in everyday life. My wife and I actually learned a new term when we took our then 18-year-old son to college in Knoxville, Tennessee some years ago. In the freshman parent orientation, we were strongly discouraged from becoming lawnmower parents. Have you heard this? A lawnmower parent goes before their child and cuts down anything that could possibly harm them. This is how some people view their relationship with Jesus that because he loves them, he should go before them and mow down, you know, mow over, remove anything that might bring difficulty, adversity, or heartache into their life. But y'all, Jesus' mission is not to remove all the bad things that can happen to us. Well, now that we know what Jesus' mission is not, let me give you just a little bit of background before we get into Luke chapter 19. By this time in his ministry, Jesus has attracted quite a following. We know that. Some people had become very authentic disciples. They sincerely wanted to be committed to him and what he was accomplishing. 
So we would say today that they were fully bought in. Others were curiosity seekers who were intrigued by this man who seemed to be able to do magic tricks, you know, just on the spur of the moment. And still others seemed to be hanging around Jesus for all the free stuff that he could give them because he benefited them personally. And yet regardless of where people stood with him, Jesus reached out time and again to touch the lives of those who needed him more than they needed anyone or anything else. So today we're gonna read about a man who encountered the mission of Jesus. Verse one of Luke 19 reads this way, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Luke tells us that Jesus' original plan did not include a stop here in the town of Jericho. In other words, this was not on his itinerary. If you read further into not only Luke's gospel, but the other three, you'll see that Jesus was eventually headed to Jerusalem. And we know what that was about, don't we? But at some point in coming into Jericho, he became aware that this man wanted to meet him. Verse number two, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Y'all, Zacchaeus was not your average Joe, as we might say. He didn't just serve the Roman government as a tax collector. He was a chief tax collector. Now, it's kind of difficult to know exactly what's known by this term, but it was probably a designation given to those who were actually in charge of those who took the tolls. Typically, such responsibilities were contracted out to those who paid the taxes up front. And then they would go and hire people who would actually go door to door to get the money that was owed Rome. And of course, they were allowed to collect not only what, that was, what was due the government, but also whatever they could get on top of it. It goes without saying that tax collectors were hated, <laughs> despised with a passion by the Jewish people because they were viewed as traitors by their fellow Jews. You see, they were in cahoots with the Roman government, their very oppressor. And because Zacchaeus was rich, he lived a very comfortable life, unlike the majority of his fellow citizens. And yet I want you to notice that all that abundance, all that opulence apparently had not satisfied him. <laughs> We know that, don't we, from experience? It left him empty, wanting something much more substantial. He was looking for what really mattered. And somehow he'd gotten word that Jesus was on his way. So he wanted to check him out. Verse three, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now in our politically correct world today, we wouldn't call Zacchaeus short, but what? I challenged, something like that. He was rather small stature, but it didn't stop him from being creative. He ran ahead and he knew where Jesus would arrive. So he gets up high where he can see him. Now, all the irony to me here is very striking. Although despised by a great many people, Zacchaeus was a person of stature and status because he held a very responsible position in society. And yet when it came to getting a glimpse of Jesus, <laughs> he didn't hesitate to swallow his pride so that he could get close to the Savior. Verse five, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up to him and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. Well, upon getting to the place where Zacchaeus was located, Jesus did with him as he had done so many people before. He engaged him one-on-one. -on -one. You see, out of all those in the crowd that day, the throngs of people that Zacchaeus could not see over, Jesus saw him. 
And what did he do? He expressed a desire to spend some time with him. Zacchaeus is overjoyed. <laughs> he probably can hardly believe it. So he hurried down and took Jesus to his home. Verse seven, all the people saw this and began to mutter, mumbling under their breath. You know what that's like? And here's what they said. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Y'all, the reaction from the crowd is immediate. It's disapproval, it's condemnation. They were absolutely aghast that the holy, righteous son of God would dare darken the door of one so wicked and who had taken advantage of so many of his own brothers and sisters in the faith. Now, maybe partly to take some heat off of Jesus, but also sincerely to come clean concerning his wrongdoing. Zacchaeus makes a bold declaration and a promise. He's already repenting of the wrongdoing he's done. He stands up, he says to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. His assurance to Jesus is very simple. You see, he will forego his conniving underhanded ways so that he can instead take care of the less fortunate. Now, a little bit later on in Judaism's history, it was considered generous to give away 20% of one's possessions. Zacchaeus willingly went way beyond that. And on top of that, he will pay back many times over 400% what he's already cheated other people out of. Loving God by loving others has now become his life's pursuit. You know, on that brief time that Zacchaeus spent with Jesus, he encountered the Savior's mission. Verses nine and 10 read, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. My message today has only one point and it comes directly from Jesus. Jesus' mission is to seek and to save the lost. Have you ever been lost? I mean really lost. Several years ago I was given permission by some church members to hunt on a piece of property that was located on Slate Road just south of here down Highway 66 a ways but it was actually easier to access the land from Payne Road, which is a little further south down the highway. And one day I went over there to look around and find a spot to hang a tree stand for the upcoming season. I parked the car, grabbed my shotgun, and went down over the hill to scout for some deer sign. And not long into my excursion, I came to a creek and began to follow it. So after quite a lengthy hike, I turned around, started to make my way back to where I had begun, but before going very far, didn't recognize anything. Nothing looked familiar. I stopped and surveyed the situation. I decided to backtrack to where I'd ended the first time and start over, hoping that confusion would give way to something that I'd seen before. But this time, things appeared different than when I'd been there the first time. <laughs> At this point, I was so turned around, I had no idea the direction to go to get anywhere near my vehicle. So I went down to the creek again and followed it, knowing that it would eventually cross a road somewhere, perhaps in Germantown or Walnut Cove. <laughs> It did. <laughs> so after going into the woods on Payne Road, I came out over on Slate Road. <laughs> I had never been so lost. Now, what did Jesus mean when he referred to Zacchaeus as lost? Well, because of his sin, Zacchaeus was out of touch with God. He was directionless and without a strong, solid foundation on which to build his life. 
Through the backing of mighty Rome, he was able to extort money from taxpayers who in most instances, y'all, were barely scraping by. <laughs> they could hardly pay their bills. His pursuit of money had blinded him to what was truly important. Those who were lost spiritually are just as directionless as I was that day. And y'all, when we're lost, we hurt in so many ways. And to help those hurts, we sometimes self-medicate. And we turn to these substitutes to help us cope with our confusion and the unrest and all the difficulty that we're experiencing. And to help, we might seek a new career. You know, if I just get a new job and make more money, I'll, I'll be happy. Or they'll try a new hobby. You know, pickleball now is all the rage. Kind of jump on the bandwagon, don't we? Yeah, that'll make me happy. Maybe I'll buy a new wardrobe. You know, if I get a different look, things will improve for me. Or I'll get a new car or find a new love life. Or in extreme cases, we'll resort to mind-numbing substances like alcohol or drugs. There are times we just think, I've got to fill this emptiness with something. You know, Zacchaeus was lost. He poured his professional energy into ripping others off so he could fill the void in his own life that was reserved only for Jesus. And what Zacchaeus needed and got was this encounter with Jesus whose mission it was to save him. And what every lost person needs today is the same. You see, our lost condition damages us to the point that our relationship with God isn't what it could or should be. Because when we're lost, we are separated from God. You know, it's interesting to view this encounter Jesus had with Zacchaeus in light of today's view of sin. In our culture, sin is glossed over. It's justified, it's rationalized, treated as no big deal. Had Jesus taken that approach, he would have patted Zacchaeus on the back and said, hey, <laughs> go on your way. Everything's gonna be fine. But he couldn't do that because his righteous character wouldn't permit him to sweep Zacchaeus' sin under the rug or just pretend that it didn't happen. Jesus is like a doctor that we go to who properly diagnoses our condition. Let's say you get to feeling bad and decide to see your general practitioner. He puts you through a thorough examination and battery of tests, including blood work. In a few days, he calls you back to his office to discuss the results. But he's not the bearer of good news. The tests have revealed that you have cancer. And although serious, it's been caught in the early stages, so they, he recommends that you see an oncologist who will know how to proceed. At your point with this highly trained specialist, he doesn't tell you to take two aspirin and call him in the morning. He doesn't tell you to go home and take your temperature. He doesn't tell you to go home and eat better. He tells you exactly what you'll need to do so you can get better. You're gonna need chemotherapy, radiation. You see, these treatments will arrest this dreaded disease that's invaded your body and threatened your life. Sin is essentially a spiritual cancer that threatens our relationship with God and unless we allow him to remove it, we're gonna suffer not only in this life, but for all eternity. The good news is our lost condition doesn't have to be permanent. For a very long time, Zacchaeus wandered aimlessly through life. But Jesus remedied that. You see, an encounter with Jesus is the cure for our sin and our lost condition. As Thomas said earlier, we can't right our own wrongs or somehow be good enough to please Jesus so that our standing with him changes. 
Jesus doesn't desire that from you and he doesn't need that from you. All Jesus asks is that we open ourselves up to him. And when we do, he will transform us from the inside out. That's what happened to Zacchaeus the day he met Jesus. He wants every single person to have this same experience. Jesus said this in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus cares deeply about wayward people, so much so that he gave his life on a cross to pay for all the wrongs that we've ever committed. The innocent sacrificed himself for the guilty. Y'all, nothing breaks God's heart like the space that we put between ourselves and him. And we know this is true because of the lengths to which he has gone to woo us, if you will, to bring us to himself. And he's taken all the initiative. <laughs> he's made all the first moves to prove to us what we mean to him. He sought Zacchaeus out that day and he seeks you out. Romans 5 says God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loves you as you are, just like he loved Zacchaeus as he was. And there's nothing that we could ever do to change the way Jesus feels about us. Nothing we could ever do to cause him to love us more or love us less. His greatest desire is to have every single one of us become a part of his kingdom and a wonderful church family like this, Poplar Springs, like so many people did here on stage this morning. And you can do that by giving your life to him. One of the most awesome parts of the gospel is the assurance that we don't have to remain in the condition we're in. Maybe you've been struggling for a long time in your lost condition, not knowing where to go or who to turn to for help. Jesus Christ is that help. He wants you to know what it's like to be free from your burden of sin and the shame and the guilt that accompany all that. You see, he knows it's way too much to bear. It is way too much to live with. So he took all the judgment, he took all the condemnation that were due each of us. He paid the penalty for your sins so that you could come to know him and be known by him. Your identity, lost sinner, can be changed today for forever. Don't you know that so many people had given up on Zacchaeus? <laughs> He'd done so many things wrong. To them, he'd committed the unpardonable sin and therefore was a lost cause. He'd swindled people out of their hard-earned money and this was very, very difficult for them, no doubt. You know, there's a chance that some people have maybe had the same thoughts about you. You've messed up. <laughs> You've committed mistakes and sins. Maybe you've done some horrible things. But you need to know that even if family and friends have given up on you, Jesus never will. He pursues you. And he comes after you with this undying love. Nobody is beyond the touch of Jesus. Nobody is beyond what he can do for you. And it's only he can remove what stands between you and him. Jesus' mission is to seek and to save the lost. Well, a couple of action points before I close. First of all, if you're not a Christian, don't delay in giving yourself to Jesus. 
Y'all, when we see the gospel message preached in the pages of scripture, there was this urgency associated with it. There was no time to be wasted if a person needed to be forgiven of their sins. Practically, if we put Jesus off, telling him, yeah, God, I'll, I'll get around to that someday. But you know, right now I'm young. I wanna have my fun. I wanna be able to do my own thing. And, and later on, you know, I'll get serious about matters of faith. If you put him off, it gets easier to do time after time. I've seen it. I've known a few people who always intended to make things right with the Lord, but for whatever reason, never did. Give your life to Jesus today. And number two, if you are a Christian, ask Jesus to use you to help save others. I wanna promise you if you pray and you express a sincere desire to talk with people about their spiritual condition, oh, God will bring people across your path. He will. If you're sincere about that, he absolutely will bring people across your path. Y'all, as I look out across this worship center, I see stories. Stories of how people were brought to Jesus through different circumstances, some very, very difficult, some heartbreaking, some life shattering. You can give hope to those who are lost by sharing what God has done in your life. You see, this wonderful news of our being saved by Jesus isn't intended to be kept to ourselves. It's a message of liberation <laughs> that we want everybody to hear. If our prayer partners will go ahead and make their way to the front, we're gonna close in prayer. And our prayer partners are here for you to discuss anything that's on your mind, anything going on in your life, if you do wanna take that step toward giving your life to Jesus, they can help walk you through that. If you have more questions about what it means to be a follower of Christ, they can help you with those questions as well. Well, let's pray. God, in Zacchaeus, each of us see a little bit of ourselves, lost, wayward people, but many of us have been touched by you and are forever grateful. So God, we wanna thank you that you've come after us. You've loved us, you've pursued us, you've sought us out as Luke describes it here in his gospel. Because our relationship with you means more than anything in this world to you. And you showed that when you sent Jesus into the world to love us and to die for us. So God, as we celebrate his death, our sins paid for, completely blotted out so that we can be clean before you. God, we thank you for the transformation that comes through that. And for those today, Lord, who may be burdened by their sin, we pray that you'll continue to burden them until they get this taken care of. And things between you, the two of you are as they should be. Lord, thank you for this worship time today. We're reminded of how great you are and how much we want to give ourselves to you and your cause. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a wonderful day.